for that. Lord Jesus, we ask that every single one of us today would see by your word and by your spirit everything as clearly as we will when we stand before you. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Today is the final of two weeks. I told you there were three threads in these two messages, and the middle thread is my story. I want to pick right back up and conclude my story today. I told you, just a quick recap, that I was standing at this door, and I knew Jesus was behind me, but I didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. And I was determined to find life or fulfillment on my own terms, but the problem was I was so self-honest that each time I went through a door, I was honest about all the selfishness I saw in my own motives and other motives. So to recap, I started off with I'm superior and that whole thing of people who complain or negative or opinions, that whole attitude of being against other people, and that is all death. So then I went to, I want to be great. I want to accomplish things. I want to be someone important. And diving into that, realizing that the whole thing of being great or important is I want everyone else to be nothing. I want to suck all the life out of them and everybody focus on me. And so that door of death got me more. You'll see an emotion that grows on the PowerPoint in me. And then I ran to, well, at least I help other people. And that's why I really, really began to hate those Christians because my helping people, no one really changed on the inside. When people became one of those real Christians, they changed dramatically on the inside, and it forced me to admit that my helping people was a whole lot of pretending, a lot of patting myself on the back. So then, the last two doors, I worshiped at the altar that all Americans worship at. Well, what's such a big deal if I want to have a little fun? Fun, pleasure. I live for pleasure. And ultimately realizing that what that says is I am an animal. I live by hormones and I just use people. And that was a massive, and it's a pretty easy death to see. But then the final one was the whole thing of love. Is love something we're out to get or something we're here to give? And the difference between worldly love and Christian love, because Christian love, love begins with loving those who hate you, but in the world it's all about get, 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 give me, give me, I'm so needy. And as you see, every door as it got more and more depth, the emotion to me is I got more and more angry to the place that finally on March 1977, at two o'clock in the morning, I decided to take a walk across a huge open field and I was going to have a confrontation with God. God and I were going to have it out. I was tired. I was exhausted. Now, a couple things about this confrontation with God. At this point, I felt like I was drowning in an ocean and all I was hanging on to was this one last little log and, and life seemed so far away. And this log was of all these doors the one I hadn't really given my all to yet was maybe I could still be a good person. Unfortunately, like, I, I'm, I've just never been good at playing games. I don't like lies. And so this whole thing of people say I'm a good person means I can do 15 perverted acts and 17 million perverted thoughts but do one nice thing. I knew that that whole scales and balances thing was a joke. I knew that at the very least, if you're going to be a good person, your morals need to improve every year, not get more and more selfish and tell yourself that once 10 years ago, I did a nice thing. So I knew that I was getting more and more selfish and more and more evil, and I, maybe, I could, maybe I can reverse the direction of my morals. So in the process, there's really three things going on. One, I'm looking for life in these other doors. Two is, as I told you, my hatred of Christians had grown to I was viciously persecuting Christians. The third one, to give the background here, was, as I mentioned last week, my dad went to a Christian church like once every two years. I knew he wasn't a real Christian, but I still, I just hated Christians. They, they, they freaked me out. So I went through a two-year process of deeply investigating every other world religion. And when I investigate these other world religions, I want you to tell, listen, I, I tell people all the time, please investigate other world religions, but investigate them on one simple scientific question. Don't listen to the marketing baloney. If you're going to investigate world religions, investigate any religion, there's only one question. And the question is, it's a very simple question, it's a yes or no question, it's a first grade question. What do you believe is the nature of man? Either man is bent towards selfishness or man is basically good. And I've already given a couple of things, a sociological test, which is if man was basically good, then every society, as they prospered, the morals would go up. But throughout history, without exception, every single society, as they have prospered, the morals have gone way. If man was basically good, keep a child free from pain, give them everything they want, and he'll be the purest, sweetest kid in history. 
Actually, what happens, it begins with a B and ends with a rat. They become a, they become a brat. <laughs> but if man was basically good, this shouldn't be that way. If you just give them everything they want, then they should. But then the real one, this is what, so I, I go to these other religions. And I, I, I deeply invest, I didn't too deeply investigate Hinduism because once they kept telling me if you give, a, you give a piece of bread to a starving child that you're keeping them from a better reincarnation, I couldn't have too much of that. <laughs> that was just like, okay, you guys, you got some, something's loose upstairs. But I deeply investigated Islam and, and Buddhism. And, uh, and, and when I probed them, I would ask this one question. Now, that's not a hard question. But it would take 10, 15 times to get them to answer, well, the esoteric nature of the universe. Okay, selfish or good? Well, in the history of the transcendental, selfish or good? Answer the question. And so then I began to probe. And so eventually you would find out that they would say, well, children who believe men have good hearts. And so I'd give the sociological to children. And then I would say this. I'd say, what about the test of everyday conversation? I didn't know Jesus' words, uh, the bunch of heart to mouth speaks, but I know that your talk is who you are. And I gave them this analogy. I said, I said, let's play a little game. I said, let's take that every time that someone talks selfish, that instead of words coming out their mouth, there would be vomit coming out their mouth. Okay? Let's play that little game. That means every time someone complains, vomit comes out. Every time a negative comment comes out, vomit comes out. Every time someone is irritated or angry, vomit comes out. Every time two people are arguing. It's not two people arguing. Two people, too selfish to be kind and listen. And yet, at every moment, there's billions of arguments going on. So every, every one of those, every moment of self-pity, every moment of, enough of you talking, focus on me, focus on me. Let me tell you about me, let me tell you about me. All that would be vomit. So let's gather 50,000 of them in a stadium and let them all talk. Let's watch what happens. <laughs> and so I would drill down on these guys, and I'd say, so the Christians say... That man is basically selfish. Are you saying he, he's, and, and finally pinned down to, and quit, quit distracting, quit changing the subject. Is he basically good? So I would ask them these questions, and they would say things to me like, you're a very intense individual. I, I just like answers. I like answers. Quit telling me it's esoteric. I said, do you have people who change on the inside and are no longer selfish? I had a Buddhist monk want to fight me. A little guy. And I said, look, I, I beat people up all the time. I don't, I'm not going to beat up a Buddhist monk. Back off, little man. <laughs> so what I learned is there are not hundreds of religions in the world. There is not. There is only two religions in the world. Every major world religion says the nature of man is I am good and I can improve. Christianity says I am selfish to the core. And the more selfish I am, the more I lie to myself. I'm going to ask you a question right at the end of the sermon. Here's the answer. A self-deceived person. You know what the definition of self-deceived is? I don't know when I'm lying to myself. The middle blank is no. I'm going to say self-deceived is I don't blank when I'm lying to myself. What's the blank? No. I don't know when I'm lying to myself. And I'll show you at the end how they actually lie. People lie to themselves. They don't even realize they've lied to themselves. Christianity says people are selfish and they lie to themselves, don't even know they're lying to themselves, and they cannot stop sinning. So there's, a, there's only two religions. And then all these other world religions, you say, well, what's your expectation of people? What's your moral expectation? And they all pervert it to, well, if you just want to do good, then you have a good heart. You know what I told them? I said, that is dog poop covered with cake icing. <laughs> but I didn't use the word poop. I said, are you telling me, have you, have you ever listen to people's lines if I have a good heart? If I just want to do good, I have a good heart. Are you telling me you're not held accountable to your actions so I can be a predator molesting kids, but if I once wished I could help a little lady across the street that I have a good heart? Well, no. Well, that's what you said. Oh, that's what I said. Yes, it is. Are you accountable for your actions? And how about are you accountable for your selfish motives? And they would, they would say, you're a very intense person. I like answers. And here's the worst part for me. The worst part was the more I talked to the other religions, I realized, and I, was, I, I said, they're the most self-deceived people I've ever met. I realized all these other religions are proof of Christianity. And that, and that really upset me because I hated Christians. But Christians at least are straight up. Christians will look you in the eye and say, well, God expects his perfection. You must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. 
So here's the bottom line. I'm out in this ocean. And all these other doors of my own efforts have gone to death. I've given up on all these other religions. They're, they're, they're more screwed up than I am. But I'm still at war with God. I cannot... Uh, and, and emptiness is overwhelming me and the shoreline feels so far away. So it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm going to confront God. So what I said was, okay, here's what I'm going to do. For the next two months, I'm going to improve morally. I didn't set out to be a saint. All I said was, I'm going to return to the standard I was in high school. Not so high. And I knew that Christians say that I had more, higher standards of morals when I was under my parents' responsibility and I got off from under my parents' responsibility. Christians say the more selfish someone they can get away with, the more they will eventually do. So I knew I was living proof and I was going to prove them wrong. So I said, okay, for the next two months, I'm going to stop fighting people. Now, I didn't get in a single fight in high school. I was a nice guy in high school. But I was fighting all the time now. Number two, I'm going to treat every female like I would want someone to treat my sisters. I have three sisters. And number three, I'm going to quit getting drunk. In fact, I'm not going to take a drop of alcohol for the next two months. That's not much. I, I, would, yeah, I would go three, four months without drinking alcohol in high school. So all I want to do is just doggy paddle back to where I was two years ago. Not much. Else. But then I said this. I said, but I want to be clear. I'm going to improve myself morally, and I'm going to do it purely by human willpower. And I looked at heaven, and I said, God of the universe, I want you to butt out. I want to be very clear that two months from now, when I've had no fights and treated everyone like a, with great respect and morally right, and when I've had no alcohol, I want to be very clear that I did it by my willpower and you didn't help me at all. And then to seal the deal, at the top of my lungs, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the Auburn campus, I sang Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. Top of my lungs. Regrets, I have a few, but then again, too few to mention. I sang just this bad. I did what I had to do. I saw it through without exemption. I planned each jotted course. Each careful. I don't think I woke anybody up. It was a big field, but I don't know. Along the highway, but more, much more than this, I did it my way. And I told God. Fast forward two months, it's now May 1977. For two years, my morals have been going downhill in those three years. I picked the three years where I've been slipping the worst. From that moment, it was like I was a granite rock dropped from an airplane. I'd never been, I'd never touched a drop of alcohol before six o'clock at night in my life. The next day, by six o'clock at night, I'd been in two fights done immoral things, and was drunk as a skunk. The very next day, and I'm a strong person. I got up the next day. I got up the next day for 60 days and said, oh, I will do better. I'm a wrestler. God didn't just pin me. He pinned me, put his foot on my neck, and then he broke every bone in my soul. Snap, 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 snap. You want to take me on? Snap. This is who you are are apart from me to the place that two months later it was three days before school was out it was may 1977 and i'm sitting in my fraternity room i'm on the floor and there's a girl here my roommate is there the very small room my roommate realized that there was immoral things about to go on so he graciously left the room to give us privacy shut the door behind her and this girl that i'm about to do immoral things with i'm stooping to a level i've never stooped before i didn't like her and I wasn't even attracted to her. And I was about to use her. And I couldn't even, the couch was behind me. I couldn't even sit on the couch. I was just such a low, loathable, repugnant mass of humanity. I'm just sitting there on the floor. And she's making her moves and talking. And gets, I was just so dead. So she finally gets up and locks the door. And just comes over and starts taking off my clothes. And I just, I just took her hands. I didn't hurt her. I just gently pushed her hands away. And I said, please just leave. And I couldn't even look her in the eye. I just looked away. And she said, what, what's the matter? Don't you da 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 And I said, I said, just go. She said, what is up with you? And I said, 
we were all talking about summer. I said, this summer, I'm going to die. She got real freaked out, and she left. She went and told one of my fraternity brothers, I, I think he's suicidal. And the guy came in, and he, says, he said, dude, she said, you're, you're thinking of killing yourself. We said dude in the 70s. <laughs> we didn't say bro. I wish we'd had bro. I really like bro. We would have used that a lot. We sure didn't have bromance. But we said dude all the time. So he comes down. I'm just sitting there on the floor. And he says, dude, are you, are you, are you we're just guys. He said, dude, are you thinking of killing yourself? And I said, no. So she said, you're going to die this summer. I said, yes. and I, but this is a guy, a kind of good friend. So I, I could look him in the eye. And I looked him right in the eye. And I said, I said do you know any of those those real Christians, I don't mean the fake Christians, I mean the real ones. I mean like crazy, fanatical, in love with Jesus, real Christ Christians. Do you know any of those real ones? And he looked at me and says, I don't know, man, I don't go to church too much. And I said, I know some. I said, and they're, they're, they're like Martians. I said, they just don't, they don't fit on this world. I said, I said, I, I'm so dead inside. I said, I've got to find out if they're real. And being the typical, sensitive, perceptive college guy, he said, okay, so you're not going to kill yourself? <laughs> I said, no, dude, I'm not going to kill myself. And he left. <laughs> so three days later, I got home to Atlanta, Georgia, and there was a girl in Atlanta, Georgia, that a year ago, I had hit on her. And I'd had other girls that you hit on that say, well, first come to Bible study with me. I didn't go to church, but I discovered they had these little Wednesday night Bible studies where it's 15-minute Bible study, 15 minutes of cookies and punch, and then half hour later, you're in the car doing things that Bible study girls should not do. So I had no problem with taking out girls who want to go to Bible study first. I'd been there plenty of times to find out these little fake Christian girls, they felt a little better if you give them a little 15 minutes of cookies and punch and Bible study, and then they go do their thing. And so uh, um, uh, when I hit on this girl, I didn't know her very well. She was hot. And I said, hey, you want to go out? Said, well, sure, if you go to Bible study with me. And I was like, great. That Wednesday night. No, it's Saturday night. I thought, Saturday night Bible study? I never heard of a Saturday night Bible study. <laughs> what church is that? Well, we actually meet in the house. Okay, well, no problem. I picked her up. And so we get there. I thought, 7 o'clock, you know, by 8 o'clock, we'll be alone somewhere. And so the Bible starts at 7 o'clock. They took their first break at 9.30. They were in the living room. Now, I know they were in the living room, but I only spent about 20 minutes in there. I spent, like, most of the time I have to go to the bathroom, wandering the house. I, they were kind of crazy. So finally at 930, they, they're taking a break, you know, and, and, and I said, oh, good, we're done. Let's, maybe we can catch a late movie. And she said, no, this is just our first break. And I'm, first break. First break. What, what time do you guys usually end? She said, oh, usually we're done by about one, sometimes two. And then I lied through my teeth. I said, I had somewhere I had to be at 10. Can you get a ride home? And I just left her. I just dumped her. I wasn't a moral guy. And so uh, um, a year later, when I come home, I mean, I mean, within an hour of getting home, I called her parents. I said, so-and-so there. And they said, she's in Europe. She won't be back for two months. And I waited two months. Two months later. Two months. Two long months. Middle of July, the day she got back, I called her and I said, do you guys still have that Saturday night thing? And she, yeah, oh yeah, can I come? And she said, she said, she said yeah, let's take separate cars. <laughs> no problem. So... So I get there. Now, these people that, this was 43 years ago, they're still very dear friends to me, almost everyone in that Bible study. But they all joke about the day I came to that Bible study because I didn't leave my chair this time. I didn't go to the bathroom. I sat there. And, and, and no matter what they did, I stared. They, they talk about the six-hour stare. I stared at them for six hours. And I just stared. They closed their eyes and pray. I stared. <laughs> I just stared. And that six hours felt like six minutes. I never seen men hug. I never saw a man hug in my life. I never saw a man hug another man in my entire life. 
They do that now all over the world. They didn't do that in the 70s. I saw men cry. I saw people standing for like an hour, lifting their hands and singing with passion and tears. And, and then they would they'd read the Bible, and then they'd talk about the Bible, and then they would, they would sit in a chair, and they would just spill their guts and tell, I mean, tell personal stuff and painful. I, I, I just stared and stared and stared. And my mind, understand, I have like a thousand thoughts going every second in my mind. In six hours, I had two words. It's real. It's real. And at one o'clock in the morning when they were done, I, I, I looked at her and I said, am I, am I, I don't know what the rules were. These people were different. <laughs> Listen, I knew those ones in our Bible study rules, but I didn't know. And, and I said, am I allowed to come back? She said, you're welcome anytime. So I came back the next week and I... I stared for six hours, but this time, somewhere about halfway through the night, I said, uh, I know you're God, and I know you're Jesus, and I don't know how to do this, I, but uh, if you want this pile of crap, I, everything I am and all that I, I'm yours. And so I just said it in my head, I didn't know what else to do. So the night was over, and I said to them, I said, where do you guys go to church? And they said, we all go to Mount Perrin. There was, there's only one Mount Perrin in those days, Mount Perrin, they go to Sunday night service, and and my parent church of God, and, and uh, I said, can I go with you? And they said, we'd love to have you. So I thought, well, i got to go buy a Bible. I never had a Bible before. I didn't know there was Christian bookstores, by the way. I'd never heard of that. And so I wanted to buy a Bible. So I go where I bought everything. I went to Sears and Roebuck. <laughs> everything I ever bought in my life, I can get at Sears and Roebuck. <laughs> Today, they don't even have a Sears and Roebuck. But, but in those days, Sears and Roebuck sold Bibles. So I went to Sears and Roebuck, bought me a Bible, Came to church that night, and they all sat in the front row of the balcony, and 2,000 people in this massive, and Dr. Paul Walker, I don't remember what all he preached. I just remember he said this one line that just, he said, the, he said, he said, the blood of Jesus will give you a clean heart. And so I came down at the altar call. There were 200 of us down there, and we were packed in like sardines, and and they said, we're going to take you and give you a private time. And they walked us down this hallway, brought us into a room bigger than this. And as each one of us came in the room, and, and a person would gently put their hands on our shoulders. They were very gracious and very organized. And this old man, now I was 19, so he, I don't know, oh, everybody was old at 19. <laughs> I mean, he may have been 60s or 70s. You know, he was old. He was ancient. Um, uh, puts his hand on my shoulder, but I'm walking down the hallway, and he, that line he kept saying... <laughs> I'm walking towards this hallway, and it's like I could, I'm walking towards light, and I could see my soul, and it wasn't that I was covered with tar and covered with sewage. I was sewage. I could see all the filth and all the meanness and all the arrogance and all the cruelty and all the anger and all the selfishness that was me to the very core. I was tar, and I was sewage. He brought us in this door and down the center on. I barely made it to the second row. And listen, I, I never cried. My, my dad would strip me naked and call in my five siblings and my mom, and he would beat me. He, would, he, he took boards and broke bones, and I never once cried. I had cried since I was two years old. I fell on that pew, and I began to sob and sob and sob in the presence of a holy God. I was broken. And this dear man stayed there with me. He kept handing me Kleenex. He only left two times to go get two more boxes of Kleenex. <laughs> and we, when I first started, all I know, I don't know how long I cried. I do tell you this. When we came in that room, there were 400 of us. When I finally stopped crying, it was just me and him. <laughs> I, I don't, it may have been an hour. But when I finally stood up and we were done and we'd done praying, I knew that I had found forgiveness and internal, eternal life. And from that day forward to forever, Jesus, I live only for you, and you live through me. Now, I want you to look me in the eyes and listen to me. We're going to answer five questions, and they're on your handout. And if you will give me every bit of your heart, I promise you, you will know exactly every detail about what will happen when you stand before Jesus. Will you be with me today? Yeah. All right, question number one. I have never once looked back or hesitated. Why? 
Because the Bible says it takes two truths to walk with Jesus. One is we have to see that everything of Jesus is life, but the foundation. Somebody say foundation. foundation. Jesus talked a lot about the foundation. The foundation of Christianity is that everything, everything, everything of me in charge apart from Jesus always ends in self lies, misery, emptiness, and death. And biblically, if you write this down, what percentage of the Bible talks about this? Write down on your handouts 90%. Of all the verses in the Bible, 90% are salvation starts with death. 90% of the Bible is not on God is life, Jesus is life. People know, if you've met one real Christian, you know that Jesus is life. What you don't know is that you are walking acid, that you are walking poison. And you can't be mostly dead, you have to be totally dead, because here's what happens, watch this. People start to walk with God thinking God is good and career is good. God is good and... Success is good. And so what happens when you walk with God, there are times you will not see the goodness of God. And only true Christians know this. Remember last week I said most Christians are fake, according to Jesus. But when you don't see the goodness of God, you keep on walking. Because although you don't see his goodness, you absolutely know that everything that way is death and if there is a one millionth of one percent chance that one thing back there will satisfy you have to turn back oh if just pleasure of just being impressive that's why you have to die completely which leads to the next question what is the commitment in becoming a christian now listen to me clearly before i tell you this i'll tell you in advance forgive your pastors forgive your bible teachers what I'm about to tell you is what exactly the words you will hear when you stand before Jesus. I'm about to prove it to you. I'm going to give you Jesus' own words. There's only one passage on salvation in all the Bible. It's the only passage ever used in persecuted countries. Unfortunately, it's the one passage the American church avoids like crazy, but it's the exact specific words of Jesus who tells you who will go to heaven and who will not. And do you know that in every persecuted country, this is the only passage they use to bring people to Christ, and it's never used in the American church. Almost never. It is today. So forgive your pastor, but be, beware why before you start pointing fingers at anyone, you had the Bible yourself. Most of all, be thankful you're here today because in about 20 minutes, you'll get a chance to finish the processing on this subject. So be thankful that you, before you died, you had a chance to see what the truth is. So the minimum, say minimum. This is the non-negotiable minimum with Jesus is to be a Christian is my only purpose in life is that by the power of your word, your spirit, and your church, I will turn away from selfishness and live to bring others to you. And that has, for every Christian who's ever lived and every Christian in heaven and every Christian in persecuted countries and every page in the New Testament has three applications. Number one, you immediately get water baptized. Now look me in the eyes. We're talking about what you, when you stand before Jesus. If you call yourself a Christian and you've not been water baptized, here's what Matthew 10, 31, 32 says. Acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. Deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. When I got born again, the very next day, I read my New Testament cover to cover. I read it five times in five days. I read the entire New Testament almost every day for about six months. I mean, I met Matthew through Revelation. I would spend three, four hours reading the Bible. But the very first day, I realized, oh my gosh, every single one of them got baptized immediately. I must get baptized immediately. Called up my friend, I must be baptized immediately. You sure do. Let's get you baptized this Sunday. So if you've not been water baptized, and the word means immersed, you're immersed because I have died, and I want the whole world to know in a corporate membership of the church that John Fitner is dead, and Jesus Christ is resurrected, then you, by your actions, have renounced Jesus. So when I give you a chance in 15 minutes to stand up, no matter what your background is, you say from this day forward, this is your chance to get it right. The second thing is always in God's word and prayer. Let me talk about this third one, always faithfully serving in a Bible-based church. If I could, dear ones, I would spend 500 hours in every one of you in the New Testament. But here's what every pastor knows. The real Christians versus the fake ones. Jesus commanded all of us to be deeply embedded in a church, to be serving in a church, and to live as servants. I could show you all those words, and it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Every pastor knows, and I could, I've been a pastor now for 40 years. I could show, I could show you the names of 10,000 people on both sides, and the Grand Canyon is in between them. 
The 10,000 people on this side, they come to church and they would never, you, they would sh let you shoot them before they would ever, quote, attend church. They come and they say, I'm here to serve. Where do you need me? What they understand is the power of God is in the word of God. The power of God is in the spirit of God. But the power of God is greatest in the heart of Christ. And the purpose of the church is when you come in the church to serve, something of the heart of Christ comes up and you come alive with, it's his kingdom. It's his purpose. This is the only place where his kingdom comes alive in you and you say, my only purpose for living is to bring other people to Jesus. So this group, they say, I would never attend church. This group, on the other hand, they say everything is always the word I. Well, I'm not sure what you're, I'm not sure if I can make, here's the funny, I'm not sure if I can make it to church this weekend. I'm not sure if I'm ready to commit. I'm not sure if I'm ready to serve. And, you, and no one doubts, no one doubts who's in charge of their life. Who's in charge of their life? They are. And every pastor will tell you over 10, 20 years, this group, emptiness, frustration, troubles, but they are the John 15, 6, they just wither. This group, I don't care how screwed up they are, their vitality, life, but Jesus called it fruit. And so the issue is there's this embedded power for people who I live for him. And I can show it to you. Listen, I have spent 43 years living in the, it's on every page in the New Testament, but if you don't want to see it, you can pretend it's not there. So, so these things this is what a Christian is. Now, let's go to the next one. They'll help you a whole lot. All right, what about, I knew, I've known some people who were passionate for Jesus for a short time, but are not anymore. Now, remember last week I told you Jesus said most Christians are not. Remember that? Scary stuff, wasn't it? I told you six different passages. Look me in the eyes. Hear me. Those six major passages where Jesus said many or most who call themselves Christians will be fake and will find out too late that they never were Christians. Dear ones, that's not the only passages. I just gave you the six major passages where that was the only thing he said. He said it like 15 to 20 times. He said it practically every time he opened his mouth when he was covering other things. So I'm gonna give you a bunch more passages today. So on this subject, I had a brother come up to me last week. And this is a brother who I've reached out to probably 30 times in the last five years, but never really has time for me. He came to this church and for the first five years or so, he was like, I'm here, never miss church, I'm here to serve. You can always tell a servant because they say, wherever you need me. And it's just all in. But then for the last, but last five years, I don't think, and there was a transition to here, but for basically for the last five years, there hasn't been one month that he's been in church, in church four weekends in a row. And people, we got six services. He hasn't made church four weekends in a row in one month. And most of all, he hasn't served in any one single area because his life is really busy. So he comes up to me and we're very close. And he said, uh, we need to talk. Now, this is after I've tried to meet with him like 30 times in five years. And, well, we need to talk. And I said, I'm so glad you're here. And I said, I, uh, um, I'm really hoping you'll get saved. And he was shook up by that. And he said these words, I still love Jesus. What was the word before love? I, I still. I, I can back off and still be a Christian. This is the minimum. I live only for Jesus. And I, and I said these words, and this is, this, is, this is, I'm not being to be funny, although it is kind of funny. I'm just funny without trying. <laughs> I said, yeah, most guys still love every girl they dated. I said, yeah, you dated Jesus. He says, so you don't think I'm going to heaven? I said, no, I'm pretty, pretty sure you're not, but I, well, don't ever, listen, what I think in 10 cents will get you a piece of bubble gum. We'll look at what the Bible says. He said, well, first explain to me why. And I said, I'll give you my best guess. I said, when you came to Jesus, and we're very close, I said, everything in your life was a wreck. Your marriage was a wreck, health, your kids, your career, finance, everything. This man was a wreck. So you saw yourself as a total failure. But then while you were dating Jesus, he started blessing every area of your life. And you found in love with that very evil word. It's an alcoholic word. S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S. Success. You still love Jesus. You just love success. 
And I, listen, I, I love Jesus, but this, that's life. But boy, this is life too, and this is life too. And I just got a lot going on. And I'm going to see if I can make a church this weekend. I got a lot going on, but I don't know if I have time for all that because I got a lot going on. I said, so no, I don't think you ever got it because I came to Jesus as a success. And that's how I knew success is poison. You, however, had never tasted success. I said, so no, I don't think you ever got it. I said, but let's look what the Bible says. Don't ever trust me. So here's what, listen, the only passage in the Bible on salvation is Luke 14. This is the passage that will be read to you when you stand before Jesus. Are you ready for it? If anyone, are you ready for it? Yes. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. In other words, anything that you want, that you think you might want, think you might bring life, must be death to you, must be poison to you. That person cannot be my disciple. Then he goes more specific, verse 27. And whoever does not, next three words. In other words, you have a mission, the cross, the message of redemption. This is, this is all I live for. This is all I live for. This is all. Look at these verses right here. I quoted them to you last week. 2 Corinthians. Now, these are not unclear verses. 2 Corinthians 5.15. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but should live for him who, who died for them and was raised again. You know what the next five verses say? Next verse says, we look at every single person. Every time we go, are you going to heaven or hell? Heaven or hell? Heaven or hell? It says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Four verses later, it says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So this whole thing of, well, I'm not sure if I have time. My God, it's just scary. No, I don't live for myself. I live for him in every minute of my life. So Jesus said, now this is important. Anybody ever taught English? Any English teachers? It's a very important point of grammar. Do you know what the difference is between a positive and a double negative? They're very intentional in grammar. A positive has, I need you to say this word. Everybody say it, it's important. Say the word exceptions. A double negative is when you want to make clear there's never an exception. So when you give a positive, Jesus could have said, Everyone who follows me must carry their cross. And you said, that's a wonderful general principle. Wonderful, fine, overall directive. But I'm sure there are some exceptions. After all, it's just a general principle. And just, he's just speaking in generalities. And Jesus said, no, nah, I'm not having none of that game. So I'm going to nail this sucker down. I'm not giving you a positive, I'm giving me a double negative. Because when you give a double negative, you make it clear there is never, ever, ever any exception. So he said, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me can not. If this is not the only, and you say, well, you mean I can't have a marriage and kids? Don't play games. If you live only to let people, to people see Jesus. And of course, you're going to be the best husband, the best worker, the best father, because that's all so people can see Jesus. So of course, all that. So uh, now watch the next part. Suppose one of you builds a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will what? I do got to tell you one thing. I said that I could never rattle the real Christians. I did find one line that really cut the real Christians. You know what it was? I would go to the real Christians and I'd say, hey, what about so-and-so? They're all on fire for Jesus, and now they're just as much a blank as I am. What about so-and-so? They were, man, I found that that hurt them. And I <laughs> hurt them a lot. But I loved ridiculing the short-termers, I called them. On fire for Jesus for a while. Still go to church every now and then. I ridiculed them. Found out that's the only thing I could do that really cut the real ones. Really. That was evil. Jesus said, those were short term, but they no longer, the only reason they live, people will ridicule. Listen, forgive the person who told you, oh, just pray this prayer quick, quick, quick. Jesus said, go slow. That's why we're taking our time. Lay it out. 
saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Suppose the king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off. We'll ask for terms of peace. Verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up every, any equivocation there, everything you have can double negative. Be my disciples. And he doesn't stop there. He says, salt. You know what the purpose of salt is? Single purpose, to make you thirsty. Thirsty. I live everything I do. Why are you so nice to the ticket person? I want to make them thirsty. Why do you respond so well when that person didn't handle your changing of your tie well? Because I want to make them thirsty. Everything, I want to make people thirsty. Salt is good, one purpose, but if it loses its saltiness, well, how often do you think about bringing other people to Jesus? Oh, I don't know. Last year once I thought about it. How can we make salty a good? It is fit neither for the soil nor the mineral power. It is thrown out. Now, is that clear enough for you? How about 1 John 2, 19? They went out from us meaning they're no longer consumed with living only for Jesus. They're no longer in the word and in prayer, and they no longer say, you could hold a gun to my head, I would never, quote, attend a church. I don't hang out with the fake ones. Uh, and I don't disregard every page of the New Testament. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they're going, what's the next word? Show. Show. See, when you stand before Jesus, it ain't gonna be what John Fittner says that they never did get it in the first place. Here's more of Jesus. I'll give you two more. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only for a short time, but when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Actually, three more. Matthew, next, very next verse, Matthew 13, 22. The seed falling among thorns refers to someone who hears the word but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of... Look at me, look at me. This is the number of negative things that have happened in this brother's life I told you about in the last five years. How many? Zero. Zero. Every single heir of his life had been blessed. And I have no doubt, again, if he'd had a crisis, he'd have come running back to Jesus. But no one who runs to Jesus in crisis is going to heaven. No one. No one. You cannot. He is not a safe harbor in a storm. He is life. And everything of you is death, or you will stand in here, I never knew you. And so I told him that. I said, man, you, you're, just, you're just become important. You got things to worry about. You got a lot of busy things. You're too busy to serve, because after all, you're in charge. John 15, 6, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away, and, and everybody on this group, all those attenders, they all... Check them all five, ten years later. They've all withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, fire and burnt. Now, I've got about five more minutes. These last two are only for non-Christians. Hang with me. If you're a non-Christian, I love the zombie stuff, by the way. Okay, this whole selfish nature. This whole thing about selfish nature of man. I'm going to ask four questions. We're going to have fun. Every time I ask the question, you say, with a little sass and a lot of volume, I'm so glad you asked. Let's practice. Ready? I'm so glad you asked. All right. What about other religions? I'm so glad you asked. As a matter of fact, there's only two. Please research them, but bore down on sociology and children and conversation. And is man truly bent towards selfishness or is he really good? Don't play games. Number two, what about science? Because so as a matter of fact, you can ask any question on science and I will show you fascinating, detailed websites that give scientific answers that are in line with the Bible. But here's the deal. Science is about certain measurables. And there's nothing more certain and measurable than the sociology, the aspect of children, conversation, and your own soul on the subject of the nature of man. So if you want certain answers, start with the area that has the most certain measurables. Number three, what about the Bible? I'm so glad you 
Because here's the deal. I, I found out when you hit the, the fake Christians, you could really rattle them on the, ah, you foolish Christians, you study a bunch of book that made up by man. Copy. I had no idea what I was talking about. Neither does anyone else when they say that stuff. I never researched that. And most people who attack never researched that. Then one day I ran into a real Christian. I tried that line and they wiped the floor with me. I said, you foolish Christians, you think this man-made book is the word of God. What an idiot child you are. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, John. I won't try to convince you it is the word of God. I don't think I can. You can't convince me it's not the word of God. Well, okay, going to steal me. I said, no, no, no. He said, he said, you know, the Bible has one message on every page from Genesis to Revelation. How about rather than whether it's the word of God or not, we just discuss the message of the Bible, which is that every man's heart is selfish. Could we talk about that? And I went, I, I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> and he just, so... You want to talk about the Bible? I'm not going to try to tell you it is the word of God. You can't convince me it's not. Let's talk about the message of the Bible. Number four is the most powerful one of all and the most important and the easiest one of all. What about all the ugly and terrible things in the world? If God is all good and all powerful, why doesn't he fix it? Because so you, you just proved Christianity. Game, set, match. You proved it. Are you even listening to your own question? You proved Christianity. God is alive, he's active, he's loving, and he's powerful. And here's the proof. He first paid the horrible totality of the price to remove the evil where? Inside, Inside us. Unless, of course, you still think you're a good person, which means once you had a kind thought. The word good means what, by the way? It means pure. The word good means pure. Second, he's coming back again. Could be today. We're very close. And then he's going to permanently, forever, and for all eternity, remove all evil people from the earth. Those who didn't take his offer. Where will you be when he cleanses the earth? So question number five, last one. What if I still don't think I'm a bad person? Now, here's the quiz. A self-deceived person does not blank when they're lying to themselves. A self-deceived person does not. No. Believe it or not, I can give all of this, and I still have people look me now. What if I still don't think I'm that bad of a person? And here's the scary part. This is, it's just scary. I'm saying this, I'm, the whole point is, can you ever be morally pure or clean to enter into a perfect heaven, be judged by a perfect God? Well, I still don't think I'm that bad of a person. Does this person, is that the same question? Can you be morally pure or clean versus I'm not that bad of a person? Same question at all? Does this person even realize that they lied to themselves? No, here's what they did. Their brain said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna twist and completely change the subject, but we're not gonna tell him. We're just gonna hook him by the nose and lead him over here into darkness. And he's not even gonna know it. The scary part is you don't get all of your life to make these decisions. You have moments in time when there's bubbles of light that come up and you can run away from the light or run to the light. So here's the only question, how we answer, how can I have billions of selfish actions or thoughts, even more selfish motives, stand before a perfect God who must judge all acts and motives equally and enter into a heaven where only perfect people dwell? Or you can go ahead and be, be a better person for a month. I call it heed the cacao. You don't even have to test your motives. Just do the first grade test. For one month, no cussing, no complaining, no anger, no lust. That includes sexual lust. That includes lusting after cars and houses or lusting after people paying attention to you and no lying. Very simple, five things, right? Listen, that's stepping over a pencil. It's not even that impressive. I told one guy this. He said, I'm not that bad a person. I told him this list. And before I could finish the list, he said, well, blankety blank, I can't do that. And I say, I guess not. You can't say a sentence without cussing. And I said, well, do you still think you're not, uh, not that bad? Well, I don't. I said, you're going to leave here and darkness is going to cover your mind like a shroud. I said, you don't have all of life because you don't know how to think. The scariest part about a self-deceived person, he does not know when he's lying to himself. So if you're ready today to give everything to Jesus, here's the definition. Here's the minimum. I live every minute of my life. Now, on this, I want to close with one story, and that is this. Forty years ago, in China, there were less than 10,000 Christians in the underground church. Today, there are estimates between 300 million and 400 million. 
And today, right now, somewhere in China, in the underground church, people will be giving their lives to Christ. And when they give their lives to Christ, guess what passage they will use? Luke 14. They always use Luke 14. And here's what they tell them, because in about, in about two minutes, I'm going to give you a chance to stand. And when I say stand, I'm just going to say, one, two, three, stand, and you stand. Who's going to stand? First of all, if you've never been water baptized and you're all out for Jesus, then you're going to stand. There's no doubt about that, because you're going to get this thing right. Second is if you before today never fully understood this. I don't care if you understood half or two-thirds, but if you say it's the first time I fully understood the full price, I'm going to stand You're going to come forward. We're going to kneel. We're going to pray. We're going to go into another room. They're going to sit down, talk with you, and then we're going to schedule for water baptism next week. If you've already been water baptized before, but it's the first time you understood it, you get water baptized again. Here's the story. In China, at this point, they would stop, and they would say this to them. You're in China. From this point forward, two things you will understand, that you never miss church, and you never not stop telling people about Jesus. Now, for them, church is usually 3 o'clock in the morning, walking 5 to 10 miles. And they say, you never miss church. And they say, every page of the New Testament commands that this is his body. So whatever the price tag, you never miss church. But more importantly, you never stop telling people about Jesus. And they say, we're going to make you a promise. Within, within 10 years, you will be in prison. So when you stand, count the cost. And when you're in prison, here's what they're going to do. They're going to beat you. They're going to beat you with canes. They're going to beat you. They like to beat them with canes. And when they beat you, the entire time they are beating you, they will say to you, we will let you go. We will even give you your old job back. We will give you a promotion. You can be a Christian in China. You must just promise that you will never again tell anyone about Jesus. I'm telling you, this is, you can read any book from China. This is every altar call. And they will say, if you accept their offer, you will be in hell forever. Because when you become a Christian, you are no longer in charge of your life. And the only reason you live, and they will say, there is an apostate church here in China. There's 300 to 400 million in the underground church. There's about 50,000 in the apostate church. You know what other church they call the apostate church? They have another name for it. Are you ready? The American church. And they will tell you, they will say, there are people who actually think that they can run their own life and have Jesus and all of them will be in hell. So before you stand, understand that in China, you will be in prison. You'll probably lose your family. You'll probably lose your job and they will beat you. And they will say this, for most of us, they usually get tired of beating us after six months to a year and let you go. But some of you will die. So know that you'll be in prison. You'll be beaten. But most of you will be released after six months to a year. And then they have people stand up all over the place. And you have them crippled from their time in prison. And they tell stories. They're not in a hurry. This is this and this and this and this. So before you stand, and they've gone from 40,000 to 400 million in 40 years. So before I count to three and ask you to stand, here's the price tag. And if you never understood before today, my only purpose in life is that by the power of your word, the power of your spirit, and the power embedded in, I come to the church and I live to serve because this is your body and this is where your heart is. And I will daily turn away from selfishness and live to bring others to you. And I'll do these three things as millions in persecuted countries and hundreds of millions in heaven and everything in me. And I don't care who sees, they'll be proud of you, but I don't care who sees. I want heaven to see. And from this day forward, I will mark this is the day that I knew what it meant that I live only for Jesus. I'm gonna count to three and you stand. One, Two, three, please stand. Give them a hand, people. Give them a hand. Amen. Now, amen. Amen. Come to the front. Come to the front. Now, I need a leader, a man behind a man, woman behind a woman, to come behind each other. Let's kneel. Quickly, leaders. Man behind a man, woman behind a woman. Just put your hands on their shoulders. Stand behind them as we kneel. I need a lady here. Pastor Dyke, get up on stage and take charge for me. Make sure everyone's got someone. Taisha, you're right here. There you go. Everyone got someone, Pastor Dyke? Need a man over there and a lady over there. Rest of the church, will you stand? 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Two men. Two men quickly over to the side. Go quickly. We're going to pray, and then we're going to send you into three different rooms. They're going to sit down with you, talk with you, pray with you, hear your heart, schedule you for water baptism. Next week in the entire worship time is going to be baptisms and worship. First, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you're going to pray, and those laying hands on you and all the church is going to pray with you. If you repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for paying the horrible, terrible price of taking all my evil, all my selfishness, and all my sin upon your pure, perfect soul and offering me your life. I take this exchange. I give you all of my selfishness. And I receive your free gift of righteousness. I receive a clean heart and forgiveness by the blood of Jesus that was shed for me. And when I stand before the Father and he asks why I should be led into heaven, I will tell him that Jesus died for me. His blood cleansed me. And from that day forward, by his word, by his spirit, and by the power embedded in serving in church, I lived for Jesus, and he lived through me. So I ask you, Father, when you see me, see Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I'm yours. I'm yours forever and ever and ever in Jesus name amen 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 I want to ask each person that's kneeling to stand make sure the person behind you goes with you and follow Pastor Jesse out into the rooms out here